Welcome everyone to my first review marathon. I'm going to be taking a look at Resident Evil for the next couple months. If you've seen my Let's Plays on Resident Evil Remake 1 and 2, you will know I love this series. If you haven't, they're on this channel. For the next couple of months, I'll be reviewing the classic Resident Evil games all the way to 7. And maybe a few others along the way. So join me for a time before the first person camera, before the action, before the 180 degree turn. Welcome to my review of Resident Evil Director's Cut DualShock version for the PlayStation 1. Resident Evil first released on March 22, 1996 for the PlayStation 1 and was developed and published by Capcom. Originally the game was made to be a remake of an old game called Sweet Home. Unfortunately Capcom didn't have the license for that game anymore so they had to make a different setting from it. But there are some influences between both games being the survival aspect, the limited inventory, and scattered health items. Development for Resident Evil started in 1983 and it took three years to complete. There were several different variations of Resident Evil during this time. Some variations were the original Sweet Home with updated graphics, including having it in first person. This was later scrapped after Shinji Mikami, the director for Resident Evil, found out about Alone in the Dark and discovered the fixed camera perspective that we know today. Another variation also had co-op, but that also got scrapped. Some characters they were going to add were an African American as comic relief and even a cyborg. These two were later changed into Rebecca and Barry as we know them today. When the game was finally released in Japan, under the title of Biohazard, Capcom expected to sell around 200,000 copies. It sold millions. When it finally came to releasing an international version, changes had to be made. Obviously the name ended up getting changed to Resident Evil outside of Japan because getting a trademark for Biohazard was going to be impossible in the US. There was also another game that was using that name and a metal band. Other changes include heavily editing the intro cutscene for the game and surprisingly increasing the difficulty for the game which normally a game's difficulty is actually decreased when released outside of Japan. Also during the transition, some other changes were thought up but never showed up for the final release. One change was restricting the item boxes to only have whatever is placed in them to only be in those specific boxes. It's not until 1997 when the director's cut was released, with it having the original international difficulty for the game, along with two new difficulties, a beginner difficulty, which doubles health and ammo pickups, and the new arranged difficulty. This one brings in harder enemies, rearranged item locations, and new camera and cutscenes. I didn't get too far into a range because I still had original in my head. And I completely forgot to save and lost a good 40 minutes of progress. The director's cut version is also infamous for its opening. It was originally going to have the uncensored opening that the international version didn't have. Unfortunately, it ended up having the censored version again. A few days later, Capcom released the uncensored version on their website for download. The DualShock version, released a year later and what I'm reviewing today, also had its own issue. It was decided that this version should have an improved soundtrack. The soundtrack was composed by Mamoru Samuragochi, who was hired to improve the original soundtrack, which was done by Makoto Tomozawa, Koichi Hirokaki, and Masami Ueda. I am very sorry for butchering some of these names. <laughs> Only a few tracks are good and even fewer sound better than the original. But my god, there are some choices that were bad. It's not until 2014 that Mamoru admits that he had a friend, Takashi Nigaki, who helped him in composing the soundtrack. Everyone pretty much agrees that the DualShock version of the soundtrack is bad. And I'm going to agree with him, after listening to it for over 6 hours. 
There are other versions of the game released on different consoles, like the Sega Saturn, PC, even a Game Boy Color version. And there is also a DS release, which does add touch and microphone puzzles. Alright, it's story time. And yes, there are going to be spoilers because this is a 20 year old game. The game begins with Alpha Team being sent out to investigate the disappearances in the nearby forest along with trying to find Bravo Team members who were sent out earlier. The team ends up being chased by zombie dogs and end up escaping into the mansion. Here is where the game begins and who you chose as the playable character. Choosing Chris has only happened. him and Wesker ending up inside the mansion, while Joe has Jesus. her, Barry, and Wesker wow. in the mansion. What a mansion. The main character splits off to a few rooms, finds a zombie, then rush back to the main hall to find that now Wesker is missing. Captain Wesker. Whoa. We go this? through the mansion with Chris finding Rebecca from Bravo what? Team along the way, oh. Oh, figure no. out how to escape to the back of the mansion, Sorry. and end up running into Wesker again in the dormitory. After that, we find a battery, go into the caves, have a missing Bravo team member killed by a traitor, and then go into Umbrella Secret Laboratory where we confront Wesker, deal with the tyrant, and escape. If you screwed up, you only fight the tyrant once and only escape with the monster on the loose. Resident Evil has several endings depending on who you rescue along the way. With Chris, you need to have Rebecca help and rescue Joe. With Jill, you have to have Barry help you out with the rope and rescue Chris. Why am I telling you this? Well, it's because I flacked up and escaped the hole I was in while playing as Jill, instead of waiting for Barry. This ended up with me getting the second worst ending during the playthrough, where I just rescued Chris, the mansion is now blown up, and the tyrant is now on the loose. Beating the game with either character unlocks an infinite ammo cord python and an infinite ammo rocket launcher. And each character has their own alternate costume, which is available behind a door that can't be accessed until you receive this key. The best way to know that if this is actually a 90s game is honestly the lines that they actually say. Man, some of these lines are cheesy. These lines weren't even an international snafu either. The original Biohazard had the these lines in it too. Sandwich. They just You're added right. subtitles to Barry, everything they said. My life. Time for gameplay. It's classic tank controls where holding up moves you forward and you can turn around in place by going left or right. This is an old control scheme and honestly, I can't play any classic Resident Evil with anything else. The remake actually lets you switch between the classic control scheme and a new one where you can run in any direction, but I'm so used to the original, trying to play it without the classic controls feels off to me. And I understand what people's feelings about tank controls are. It's slow, it's clunky, and more than likely you're going to end up making a mistake because you're not used to the controls. It's honestly something that I understand, but I have grown so used to playing Resident Evil with these controls that I honestly do not see myself actually playing these games with any other control scheme. To fight, you have to hold down the R1 button and press the action button to fire your weapon. The original version of this game didn't have auto-aim, which meant that if you get into a fight, you needed to move your character to aim the gun. The director's cut has auto-aim only in the arranged mode, while the DualShock version has it in every available difficulty. One issue I found that seems like it only exists in this version is where the auto-aim will aim at a zombie outside of the camera's view, and no matter how many times you shoot at the zombie, it won't die. It seems like this game may have a culling issue, where if the camera doesn't see it, it doesn't exist. Thankfully, this doesn't exist in future games. There are only a few weapons available to both characters. They're handguns, shotguns, and the revolvers. The shotguns can one-hit kill zombies if you aim for the head, and revolvers are so powerful one shot will instantly kill any non-boss monster. Jill also has access to the best weapon in the game, the bazooka, or more commonly known over the years, the grenade launcher. 
this baby can hold 6 rounds before needing to reload and can also load different types of ammunition. Chris exclusively gets the flamethrower. That's also a key. In the caves. So it can only be used in the caves. Yeah, let's move on. Both characters have a limited inventory. 6 slots for Chris and 8 for Jill. So anytime you have a full inventory, you need to use an item box. These can hold everything you find in the mansion and all items are transferred to the next box that you open. Originally, a demo was released that had the item boxes only holding whatever you they had placed inside. So if you need ammunition and you place it inside an item box on the left side of the mansion, you can't get that ammunition in the one on the right. Thankfully, that was changed before the final release. Combat against the monsters isn't too bad. The zombies are slow enough that if you're far away you can take them out, or if you're quick enough you can run past them. Then there are the dogs. They're faster and they usually come in packs of at least two or three. Soon after that we have spiders. Only in a few rooms, but nothing too bad. And finally we have the two most annoying and deadly monsters in the series. The hunters and the chimeras. The hunters appear on your second visit into the mansion and these guys hurt. They're fast and durable, but what's most dangerous about them is if you get stuck between two of them in a small hallway. If you aren't careful, they will pin you and they will slice you. And they will kill you. The chimeras only show up in the boiler room, but they just love to grab you and give you a hug around the neck. These guys are also a pain because you can miss your shots on them while they're running on the ceiling. The bosses are also very interesting in this game. Mainly because two of these bosses can actually be skipped if you're fast enough. No other Resident Evil game comes to mind that actually does this. If anyone knows of one, mention it. I may have actually forgotten about it. In terms of what you face, there is Yawn, the snake boss. You face it twice during the game, but you can skip the first encounter if you're quick enough. Then there's 42, the plant monster. This thing will whip you and throw around acid. The third boss is called Black Tiger. Hint, it's not a tiger, and it can be skipped. The final boss is the Tyrant, and a staple of the early Resident Evil trilogy. One of the toughest bosses in the game, and has to be fought twice to finish the game for the good ending. The graphics are not the best. This is a classic PS1 title. It did look nice at the time this was first released, but graphics have improved for the better. But I do like that the arrange mode gives you different camera perspectives, which does show more of the environment that is not normally shown. Two things I would like to mention. One, the FMVs. These are hilarious to look at, honestly. These had to be horrifying back in the day, but can I mention that one of them actually has a hunter showing them actually opening a door? Two, the opening and ending cutscenes were actually filmed. This is the only game that does this, and it actually gives the game a kind of charm that the follow ups don't have. Also, the reason Chris is shown in a still shot during the cast mentions is because the original uncensored version has him lighting up a cigarette. Finally, we come to the music. Normally, I would say it's fine or I don't remember much of it. The DualShock version of the soundtrack is both bad and I will remember it for the rest of my days. Oh sure, a few pieces sound nice, but my god, there are some pieces that are just bad. Wesker! Ugh. 
And let's not forget the piece de resistance, the pinnacle of bad, the song that is considered the worst piece of music for any game out there. The Basement. Alright, here's my final thoughts. I can easily say that Resident Evil Director's Cut DualShock Edition is one of the hardest Resident Evil games that I have played. This is because it's the first in the series and there are issues here and there that have been ironed out or improved on. If you ever get curious on wanting to try the game out, I would highly recommend playing the remake. Originally this review was also going to include the remake, but doing this would also include me needing to do it for 2 and 3 and Resident Evil 2 is literally going to take me about 12 hours because of how that game works. I've decided for these reviews that I won't include the remakes yet. There seems to be plans to remake Resident Evil 4 in the future and as much as I would love to include these remakes within this set of reviews, I think I can do a separate review marathon for the remakes in the future. Apologies about that. I actually wanted to mention that at the very end but I couldn't stop myself. <clears throat> Overall. Trying and completing Resident Evil has given me more appreciation for the classic series. But I'm not going to revisit this version again in the future. If you're very curious about it, I recommend finding a physical copy of the game. Mainly because purchasing the digital version will not be possible by July due to the PS3 digital store shutdown. In the end, We've just opened the door to a world of nightmares and monsters. And the next time, we'll see what the consequences of this are going to be in Raccoon City.